Hey guys, Rick here, and today I'm going to make a video that probably would have been really popular three or four years ago when the book came out, but I didn't have a booktube channel then, so you're going to get it today. So what's more worthwhile, a captivating book whose charms prove fleeting ultimately, or a difficult, at times painful book that stays with you long after you finished? That's the question I've been asking myself ever since I finished my reread of Lauren Groff's Brilliant yet ultimately frustrating, super popular novel from a couple of years ago, Fates and Furies. As lavish as the writing can be, and how much I love just the propulsive narrative in this book, there were times, especially near the end, where I could have lit it on fire and threw it in the garbage. Almost a month later, I can just, I still get chills when I just think of the idea of just drowning it in a bathtub. But, a couple of weeks later, I'm still thinking about it. So that has to mean something. Why then do I want to just laugh maniacally and cry like a crazy person as I just throw it off the top of the Chrysler building? So let's just set the stage. Fates and Furies follows Lotto and Matilde through two decades of their marriage. They're madly in love, they're glamorous, they're tall, they're just destined for greatness, they're the envy of everyone around them. They're self-sacrificing, they're generous, they're passionate, they're altruistic, they're forgiving of one another. Or so it seems from Lotto's perspective. And as we're told, every story has two sides. And the key to a lot of marriages, and certainly the marriage in Fates and Furies, is not about its truths, but its secrets. For the first half of the book, we're treated to the gregarious, creative, outgoing, loud, brash, but ultimately extremely self-serving, Lotto, which is short for Lancelot. We journey with him as he transitions from a struggling broke actor into a world famous playwright. The first half of the book, Lotto's half of the book, is just has so much energy to it. It's just like this like literary effervescence. There's this sequence where Lotto goes away on this retreat to help write an opera with somebody. And it's just it was as creatively stimulating for me as as anything I've read in a book in a really long time. And as much as Lotto just kind of drives me crazy because he's not all that likable a lot of the time and you can tell that he's kind of shitty, but you're following along with him and you're riding this wave with him so you sympathize with him a little more. So by the, by the middle of the book, Groff had me. And this is where something catastrophic happens and then the narrative switches perspectives. And the rest of the book is about Matilde's life. So we essentially go way back to the beginning before even the beginning of the book and we hear her side of things. And just like Lotto, we find that we've kind of been deceived the whole time. Marriage is made of lies, kind ones mostly, omissions. If you give voice to the things you think every day about your spouse, you'd crush them to paste. She never lied, just never said. Matilde's story is devastating in a couple of ways. On the one hand, it just holds up this mirror to this thing that we call marriage just to show how ridiculous it is and how flimsy and oblivious and ill-fated a lot of them are and why. As someone who got married in the last couple of years, this was like genuinely disturbing to read. And as, cr and as crazy as the story eventually gets, and it gets crazy, um, there's no denying Groff's point about how marriages are ultimately kind of built on lies. And they don't even have to be these big, huge ones. But in order to live and cohabitate with someone for 40, 50, 60 years, part of that is just is lying or omitting things. You have to live in a way that is cohesive to someone else living with you. And sometimes that means shutting up when you want to say something or putting on a face that you think they're going to want to see. Or in really bad cases, just completely living a lie. Hopefully that's not the case for any of you. I'm talking about the lies that we project so that others will love us more. The lies that we tell so they'll continue to love us. The lies of omission we never tell because the person would stop loving us if we ever gave these lies a voice. Even if that doesn't describe your marriage, the mere possibility of it is unsettling, like at, at the very least. And then on the other hand, Matilde's story is devastating because it's just so fucking <laughs> absurd. Like, my lingering negativity towards this novel is completely as a result 
of how terrible I thought the second half of this book was. Like Groff almost lapses into satire, I think, and completely undercuts her point. It's just a devil woman shy of days of our lives melodrama, in my opinion. With its like wicked uncles and like forced prostitutions and pregnancy scandals. It was just, it was so like, it, it just, it was so dumb. It all felt just incredibly forced and especially so when you've been waiting 200 and some pages to find out what this twist is all about that you've been hearing. Every review blog video that came out when this book was first published was about how this book hinged on this twist and how it just threw such a wrench in the story that ended up being so fascinating. Like I remember, even though these books aren't alike, it got a lot of comparisons to Gone Girl because that's another book where like halfway through the narrative shifts and things get fucking crazy. And because of those comparisons, you kind of go into the book with your mind like pre-blown <laughs> a little bit, no matter what kind of twist happens. It's like watching an M. Night Shyamalan movie now. You're just expecting one. So you either guess what it is, or it's just completely underwhelming. Like once your mind has been pre-blown, it can never be re-blown. And as much as I, as much as I didn't like the second half of this book, I'm just, I'm trying to to think whether I, I'm underwhelmed by it just because I didn't have that like holy shit, this gets so much better in the second half kind of feeling. Like I didn't have like a, that's what actually was happening moment at any point. I just thought it was stupid. But as I said, I'm still thinking about this book like quite a bit. And again, this is the second time I've read it. And so I come back to that original question. Is it better to really like a frivolous book or to have a really difficult time with a book that sticks with you for years? She was so tired of the old way of telling stories, all those too worn narrative paths, the familiar plot thickets, the fat social novels. She needed something messier something sharper, something like a bomb going off. With Fates and Furies, Groff definitely dropped a bomb. It's left a mark on me, that's for sure. Only time will tell whether that's a battle scar that I'm proud of or like this hideous blemish on my face that I just wanna get rid of. Considering that I read this again after a couple of years, probably both. As Groff tells us, it's all a matter of how you frame what you see. Thanks for watching, guys. My name is Rick. I'll see you in a couple days.